everyone. Today I'm going to be talking all about 3D printing. I've been using and showing a lot more 3D printed technology in my videos lately and seemingly every time I do kind of show anything 3D printed or a 3D printer talk about it, there's always seemingly a lot of people that are just kind of mind boggled still by the technology and not realizing just how accessible 3D printing is now for an average person. Now for me personally, I've actually only owned a 3D printer for a little over a year now at this point and I actually just bought a second one and that's kind of what inspired this video as well because I now have the perfect example to show you how this technology works and what those first steps are with getting into 3D printing. Because I know when you look online about anything 3D printing there's all of this confusing language and if you look at people generally talking about 3D printing they're seemingly these tech engineering wizards that just seem so unattainable to be able to do yourself and that's really what I wanted to do with this video is show you what actually goes into being able to 3D print. Like I said, I've really only been immersed in 3D printing for a bit over a year, but at this point I do feel like I have a decent grasp on the vital information about 3D printing and I would like to share that with you because I really want to show how someone can go from knowing basically nothing about 3D printing to being able to confidently 3D print and know how to work the technology. Let's start off by taking a look at exactly how this technology works. Most printers, regardless of type, all work off of similar principles. There are three main parts on a 3D printer that move. The bed that moves back and forth, the nozzle that moves side to side, and the rail holding the nozzle that moves up and down. You also have the extruder that pushes the print material through the nozzle, which is heated, allowing the print material to melt for printing. Those movements combined is how 3D printing technology works. Depending on the type of printer, some of those parts movements might be a bit different. To print a model using a 3D printer, you use something called a G-code file. It's kind of like the PDF of the 3D print world. A G-code is created using a program called a slicer. A slicer takes a 3D model and, as its name would suggest, slices it so that it can be produced by a 3D printer. It basically creates movement instructions for the bed and nozzle to print the material in the form of thin layers. I think one of the biggest hurdles for 3D printing is basically right off of the bat. There are all of these terms that you need to familiarize yourself with, which is not difficult and it's just kind of second nature now, but I know that was one of the biggest things when I was starting out was just understanding what the technology was and what all of the different terms meant. I think the main thing with 3D printing, if you are really interested in this technology and really want to start 3D printing, you will be successful because you will want to learn about how the different things work, want to learn about the different terms and what they mean and how to fix different problems. And that is what's going to make someone successful with 3D printing. It does not matter what your background is, how knowledgeable you are with the different types of technology and machinery like this, you can teach yourself. I know another hurdle that a lot of people are immediately concerned about is the cost of 3D printing. As usual with most technology, over time the prices drop significantly. There are incredible 3D printers now that are on or under 300 Canadian dollars. Now I know $300 is still a decent amount of money for a piece of technology, but compared to something like a Cricut machine, I would say is probably considered a far more attainable type of technology. Some Cricut machines are equal if not even more than a lot of really great 3D printers. Even normal, you know, traditional paper and ink printers can be getting up there to that price. I guess a good place to start would be, you know, why would you want to get into 3D printing? Well, for me personally, I do a lot of costume building, prop making, and 3D printing was just kind of the next thing on my list of a tool to use for that kind of branch, although I have used it for a ton of other stuff as well. And there are obviously a ton of reasons that people become interested in 3D printing. I know a very popular reason is making tabletop miniatures and different uh, scenes and pieces for tabletop games. Some people use it for prototyping, that's also something that I've been using, is using it in a more manufacturing sense. I started making travel palettes that have 3D printed parts in them. I'm sure some people just want it to have fun. I mean, there's so many things to 3D print now that you can really use it for almost anything. There is just so much you can do with this technology. 
So like I said, I did somewhat originally get interested in 3D printing because of the costume and prop making side of things, and because of that, the first 3D printer that I bought was a Creality CR10S. Now, I went with this because at the time it was one of the most popular printers, it had a whole lot of community behind it, so if you had a problem that you basically could Google it and figure out what that was. The CR-10S is also known as being a very versatile printer. It produces great quality prints and it also has a very reasonable build size. And what that is is basically the invisible cube that is the area in which the printer can print. And because I was looking at possibly making large scale props and different pieces for costumes, it just made the most sense for me. I have since then made a whole lot of modifications to it. I have a whole video talking about them and I'm not sure how much I'm going to get into them in this video, so if you want to know all about the modifications that I did for my CR-10S, I will card that video here. Some of them I have actually am going to be doing on the new 3D printer that I bought. Now, I'm sure there are some people already that are kind of freaking out at the idea of modifications, but it's a very common thing to do with those types of printers, and it's a very easy, I would say, thing to learn and teach yourself how to do. They're not necessary, they're more just personal adjustments, I guess you could say. Some of them have been known to improve certain aspects, like one of the things I did put motor dampers on all of the motors to make the printer quieter, and a lot of stuff like that. It's it's very easy to figure out and to teach yourself, I would say, um, how to make those modifications. I figured the best example that I could give to show just how not extensively intimidating 3D printing is would be to film the building process of my new printer. As you can tell from the box, I decided to get a Creality Ender 3 Pro. Now this is not going to be a tutorial on how to set up this specific printer, but more of an example on what setting up an FDM printer is like. These types of printers tend to have a very similar frame and setup process, which includes some assembly. If you think you figured out what type of 3D printer you want to buy, I would highly recommend looking up an assembly video on YouTube beforehand just so that you know exactly what you're getting into. Different printers have very different levels of detailed and helpful instructions, so seeing another person put one together can definitely help. There are also always things that aren't mentioned in instructions that are good to check as you're assembling. Things like appropriate wheel grip and other tightening adjustments you might need to make that are sometimes easier to do before you have a fully built 3D printer on your hands. I will say that I found the assembly of this printer a lot easier than my first one. I don't know if that has something to do with my experience or clear instructions, but I'd call the assembly of an Ender 3 Pro very beginner friendly. Just make sure to always read the instructions carefully and take your time. All I'm basically doing at this point is assembling the frame and attaching different components with screws. It's basically just like the computer version of IKEA furniture building. Now this is where things start to get a bit unusual. I actually decided to make some of the upgrades and modifications I wanted to do to this printer while I was building it in an effort to make installing things easier. The upgrades were pretty easy ones though, just basically swapping out things and adding improvements. Also, a lot of these upgrades tend to be fairly inexpensive, which is slightly annoying because you'd think that they might just automatically include it as part of the printer, but it's nice to have the ability to customize things to be exactly how you want them. The first thing I did was swap out the plastic extruder with a metal one. It's just one of those things that after a while the plastic can start to give out, so having a metal replacement instead can be beneficial in the long run. This was really just an ease of access thing. While the plastic parts would have been perfectly fine for quite some time, I already had the new part and figured I'd add it to the printer before it got attached. The next upgrade I decided to do was add motor dampers. Again, an easily installed and inexpensive upgrade. I found these to easily be one of the best modifications I made to my CR-10S to improve noise level, so I knew I wanted to have them on this printer as well. Now I know I said this wasn't specific build instructions for an Ender 3 Pro, but I feel like I need to put out a disclaimer that you won't be able to use motor dampers on a Pro without replacing the pressure fit pulleys, which let me tell you can be an ordeal to get off. Now we were back to the normal assembly of this printer for a bit, but now we've reached the point of adding the first of two belt tensioners. Proper belt tension is important to print quality, and having a belt tensioner makes keeping that proper tension so much easier. There's actually a bunch of belt tensioners available to 3D print, but I just decided to use the same X belt tensioner that I have on my other printer. And back to some normal printer assembly. 
Now this upgrade wasn't something I even thought about until I realized that this printer didn't have it, and that is this Z-axis mount. It basically keeps the Z-axis rod aligned. My CR-10S already had them, and it just seemed like a great idea to add one onto this printer as well. I'm very happy with the print quality that I can get out of my original printer, and it was important to me to try and achieve that same level of quality with this printer, so that I felt comfortable using them interchangeably for jobs. Now at this point, the printer is pretty much completely assembled. I just ended up taking off the original Y-axis pulley that came assembled already on the printer and changed it out with my new belt tensioner for the Y-axis. Now again, this was not an upgrade I originally had planned, but after seeing what came with the printer, I felt the need to upgrade them. And those were the bed springs. So I bought the exact same kind that was on my CR-10S and just replaced those to make them sturdier. An upgrade I did always have planned, however, was replacing the stock magnetic bed with a glass one. So I bought pretty much, again, a miniature version of the bed that I currently use on my CR-10S. And just in general, glass tends to be the preferred bed for 3D printers. And the very last step before getting this printer up and running is plugging in all of the cables. Now, I remember the very first time that I opened my CR-10S box, I kind of had a heart attack at the amount of cables that had to be plugged in, and it seemed very daunting. But honestly, everything is labeled very clearly, and there are nice diagrams generally of where things need to be plugged in. So yes, there tends to be a lot of cables, but you are just having to plug them into their appropriate spot. As you can see, we have something a little interesting going on with the printer at the moment because this is the point where I introduce you all to the wonder that is squash balls. Now, I swear, I bet the demand for squash balls has gone up like 3000% thanks to 3D printing because everyone and their dog uses these as feet replacements. And I'm sure you're wondering, why on earth does everyone use squash balls as feet? And that is because they extremely reduce the vibrations of the printer because they are nice and squishy and you can print feet that look something like this where the ball just basically sits perfectly in and, you know, sits on the desk like that. So these help the amount of vibrations that travel into whatever surface your printer is laying on, which also makes the printer print better because there are less vibrations and it also makes it quieter. Truly, the only contested part of this is whether the double yellow or single yellow squash balls work better. It's basically just the firmness of the ball. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my two remaining feet on this bad boy and then actually put the good old squash balls on and we will have the feet all done then. Now the last modification that I made to this printer was actually a 3D printed one. I printed this spool mount that moves the spool holder from the top of the printer and angles it on one of the side brackets. And here is what my fully put together and modified Ender 3 Pro looks like. Now that the printer is all set up and running, the first step is to level the bed using this handy dandy post-it note. Now I personally always like to heat up the bed and nozzle to the temperature I generally print at just so that the leveling is the most accurate. It will take into account any possible expansion due to the heat and I just find it is a good idea and it will definitely give you the most accurate bed leveling because it's mimicking what it will actually be using temperature wise. This particular printer and a lot of printers still don't have any sort of automatic bed leveling, so you're left to do it the old fashioned way, which is honestly pretty simple. You basically just take a sheet of paper and place it between the nozzle and the bed and adjust the knobs in the corners until the nozzle basically grabs onto the paper. You don't want the nozzle and the bed to be too close together. You just want a little tug when you move the paper back and forth between the nozzle and the bed. This is one of those things that you will just get better at with experience, understanding, you know, what the perfect amount of pull on that paper is for your printer. And you always want to go around to each corner a couple of times just to double check that everything is leveled. And now for our first test print. I decided to try this Baby Yoda. He's a pretty straightforward model. He does require some supports, but I figured he would be a pretty good first test. 
Other than making sure I had an Ender 3 set as my printer, I didn't really mess with many of the settings. I wanted to try the settings that I use for my CR10S to see how they would work with this printer. And I just loaded him onto the SD card that came with the printer. First step was loading up my desired filament color into the extruder. I'm just using some gray PLA for him. Then popping in the micro SD card that has the print file on it. And then turning on the printer and selecting the file that I want to print. So in this case, the Baby Yoda G code. And if you've set everything up in your slicer right, it will automatically start preheating your bed and your nozzle to your desired temperature. Now, because this was the first print on a brand new printer, I did keep the settings pretty conservative. So I decided to put him on a raft to hopefully make sure that the print was successful by the end. And a few hours later, this was the result. He does definitely have a lot of support material on him, but I didn't mess with any of those settings. I figured it was going to be much more encouraging to have my first print be a successful one than worry about all of these different settings. Which of course, because there is so much support material, that means the next step is actually removing said support material. So my trick for that is to use a pair of pliers. I have various different sizes of pliers that I specifically have for 3D printing. It's just one of those good tricks for removing support material. Actually, I'm gonna be doing an entire video about my must have tools for 3D printing things that people do not necessarily tell you would be useful and a lot of post-processing stuff, which is what you would call this step. So anything that you basically are doing to the print once it comes off of the bed. So sometimes you will have prints that you basically just take off the bed and it's good and other times you will need to do a little work on it and a few minutes of support material removal later, and this is the result. He's definitely not bad, but I did feel like I could achieve an even smoother result with a few tweaks to my settings. And so that's exactly what I did. I went in, tweaked a few things, and this is the new result, which I am extremely pleased with. The one on the left is the first Baby Yoda that I printed, and the one on the right is the new one with the far superior settings. And it is kind of crazy that a few little adjustments in your software can make such a big difference, but again, that is just something that you get used to playing around with and that you will achieve your desired print results eventually just with experience and figuring out what all of the different settings and adjustments will do to improve your print jobs. And that is everything. I hope this video gave you a decent idea and understanding of 3D print technology and maybe even inspired you to start thinking about the possibility of 3D printing. But thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video.